In terms of how quickly this can all happen, let's go through what we got. So we've got the advertising directed indication that's a 176 microsecond long packet at set to time zero. In response, we have a connect request packet that's 352 microseconds long. Um, the end of the advertising indication and the start of the connect request packet are 150 microseconds apart, which is why the connect request starts at 326 microseconds. So that's 176 plus 150. Then we have the master send an empty packet because it's got no data to send to the slave. Uh, Some time later, and you're thinking, hold on, why are you just doing nothing? There's a huge amount of space here. Remember, we've designed this for coin cell batteries. Coin cell batteries like to do small amounts of data infrequently. So this time between the connect request packet and the empty packet allows the battery to recover from advertising. We've designed this around a coin cell battery. That's what you need to do if you're doing coin cell batteries. You need to give the coin cell battery time to recover from doing strenuous things like sending packets of data. So that's what we did. And then, in response to the empty packet, the slave comes along with a handle value notification. It's an attribute uh, protocol packet. And that's a very, very small packet, 144 microseconds. Then we have an acknowledgement packet back from the master. The slave then gracefully terminates by sending a link layer termination indication. And then you get an empty packet on that, whole transaction done in approximately three milliseconds. Whole transaction. So that is, I want to connect. Master coming along saying, OK, connect, polling the slave, getting the data from the slave, acknowledging the data, getting a link layer termination indication saying gracefully to disconnect this link, and acknowledging that. So we're not trying to hide anything here. Three milliseconds, we've got the data through and gracefully disconnected this link so we can do it all again in a few milliseconds. That's how efficient we are. And we've got a huge amount of time, one and a half milliseconds, when we do absolutely nothing. So we could have made this quicker, except for the fact we designed it around coin cell batteries. So that begs the question of how low can low energy get? So one way of looking at this is to try calculating the energy per transaction. So let's make some assumptions here. So let's assume that we've got three milliseconds per minimal transaction. So we've got, say, a window sensor that advertises whenever it's detected some change in the state of the window. So if you open the window three milliseconds later, it will have sent the data to the, some central device. The central device will do something with that. And then when we close the window, it, three milliseconds later, it will have sent the data back to the central device to say, OK, the window's now closed. You could do it for car doors. You could do it for garage doors. You could do it for bicycle bells. Yeah, I don't know what you want to do, use this for. Let's say it's a window sensor. So let's estimate the TX power at 15 milliwatts. So um, you know that means that effectively we're transmitting at fairly high power. Because I'm, I'm not trying to fiddle the numbers here. You know, uh, let's assume it's a 1.5 uh, volt battery, uh, 10 milliamps times uh, 0.015 watts times three milliseconds is about 45 microjoules per transaction. Now, what does that actually mean in terms of battery life? Well, let's take an example battery. Uh, so let's take some manufacturer's battery, 1.5 volt battery, 180 milliamp hours. And this, this is a battery that costs $2. So it's quite an expensive battery, I do admit that. Um, this is retail at a shop $2, by the way, not you know, in, in units of a million. So if you buy units of a million, this would be a lot lower cost. So we've got this 180 milliamp hours, divide that by your 10 milliamps, so that's 18 hours of time. So we can do in 64,800 seconds about 21.6 million transactions. So we can open and close that window 21.6 million times before the battery runs out. That's reasonable, you know. You could have a child go, open, oh, close, open, close, open, close, open, close, open, close, open, close, open, close. OK, my car's going to get tired if we do this. Um, so let's look at this in terms of just LE transactions. So 
15,000 days, it's about 40 years worth of transactions you could do with this 180 milliamp hour battery. Now, a lot of coin cell batteries quote 220 milliamp hours. Some of them do 230 milliamp hours. So again, we, we didn't choose a battery which is as big a number as possible. We chose one that you know we just picked up off the street. So 40 years. Who sells a coin cell battery that has a lifetime of 40 years on it? Nobody. We have got a technology here that has pushed the boundaries of battery technology by almost an order of magnitude. We've got a technology here where the limit is not the lifetime based on the transactions. It's the lifetime of the battery. This is why solar power cells, uh, micro um, machines creating energy from uh, vibrate, vibrations, for example, in the back of a car, could be very interesting for this because we're using 45 microjoules of energy for a transaction. And after, after that, you know, you can, you can get 45 microjoules of energy pretty easily from a solar cell. So do remember there are some caveats here. So the communication part is only part of it. So at somehow, if you're doing a sensing of more than just an open close, which might be just a PIO line, you're going to have to have something that monitors that. So if you're monitoring temperature, for example, and every time the temperature changes by more than, say, two degrees, you send an indication, you know, so you do this three millisecond transaction, then you've got to budget some power for that RTD circuit for the temperature sensing. But remember that if you're doing temperature, you probably care about that when you've got a light on in the room, and therefore you can use scavenge power of a solar cell. And so, you know, and you can probably put that solar cell behind the display that is displaying what the current temperature is. So once you look at it from that point of view, we can have Bluetooth low energy devices that effectively have unlimited battery life or unlimited lifetimes. And that's quite a change to the way that we think of wireless technology. All because we can get down to about 45 microjoules per transaction. The other thing to note here is that batteries themselves have leakage current. Batteries, if you just leave them there, will use current. They are chemical reactions at the end of the day, and chemical reactions will occur even if you're not taking energy out of that battery. So the limit of the current coming out of that battery might actually be, or the, the peak uh, amount of current coming out of that battery might be the internal battery leakage. Nothing to do with the radio. It, when, when I first looked at these numbers, it blew my mind absolutely blew my mind. It's like, why is the battery technology so far behind where we are with radio technology? And what can we do to improve that? So I'm hoping that somebody in here is from a battery manufacturer and is thinking of the word carbon nanotube or something like that, because I think we're gonna have to go in that direction. So as always, your mileage may vary. Um, you know, we were based on 45 microjoules per transaction. Uh, obviously, if you that assumes that the peer device is constantly scanning. So if the peer device isn't constantly scanning, if it's running a 50% duty cycle, for example, because it's trying to do other stuff, then the amount of joules required to initiate that transaction may be a little more. All of these may have some impact on the transaction itself. And again, I'm going to repeat this, but the sensor itself will draw power. Um, so, you know, this is one of the big problems I have uh, with the industry. I was at a MEMS conference uh, the other week, and a lot of the MEMS, the largest market for MEMS devices in the, is in the automotive industry, where at the moment, power doesn't really matter because you've got this huge, great, big kilowatt generator, hundreds of kilowatt generator at the front of the vehicle, or at the back if it's a Porsche 911, but at the front of the vehicle, that can generate a huge amount of power. So who cares about battery consumption? Who cares about energy consumption for one of those MEM sensors? If you're butting in one of these, if you're using, you know, let's say 200 um, microjoules just to sense what's happening with that uh, micro machine, 
that's going to blow your battery budget from 40 years down to like 10 years. OK, that doesn't sound too dramatic, quite frankly, but it is a big problem. So you've got to think about the system cost. So what is your sensor doing? How can you reduce the power consumption of that sensor? How can those sensor manufacturers reduce the power consumption? You know, another big problem is that a lot of these sensors are running off 5 volts or 9 volts even. And we need to effectively go down to 1.5 or 1.1 volts to be very efficient. So again, it's a system design cost that we need to consider.